So if you're a parent of a child with special educational needs at or about to go to secondary school, have you had trouble getting support that you believe your child needs from your local authority? A week or so ago, uh, one of our listeners asked us to look into the problem she was having getting her son Riley into the secondary school of her choice. So we sent our reporter Anna O'Neill down to Kingston to meet us. Uh, tell us a bit, if you will, Anna, about the family. What is their situation? Well, Lee called us up, I think it was the week before last, actually. She has three children, the youngest of whom is 11-year-old Riley. He's at primary school at the moment in year six. He's about to go to secondary school in September, and he has a severe visual impairment, which means that he can see a bit, but he uses a white stick to walk around and he has other complications to his disability as well such as uh, renal problems and a detached retina and although he's at mainstream school at the moment his needs have become more c complex as he's got older so about a year or so ago when he was in year five his mum started looking at possible schools for him for secondary. We'd looked into all the options online which are supported and approved by the local authority um, and one of which when we were at a VI event we found the New College Worcester. He absolutely loved it. He's, we've been there for a uh, open day. We've been there, He's been for a taster weekend. He's been assessed by them. He loves it wants to go now you know the fact that he's keen to go and, that, and it would be inquire, require him to go boarding he's fine with that um so let's rewind a second this is new college in worcester yes. not kingston it's not and the reason for that is um simply because on the list there simply is not a school for um children with who are visually impaired or blind which is within our borough now I didn't look at where something was to select a school. We simply chose what we f felt was the most appropriate school for Riley. From an approved list by the local authority? Yes, it was from their approved list. There is actually a boy there who's from Kingston Borough as well. So to me, it was like, OK, this is all good to go. So she then followed what she thought was the usual procedure for children with special needs about to go to secondary school. I contacted his Senko at the school. The Senko at the school asked me to contact a lady at the local authority. She said, oh, you'll have heard from her before. I said, no, I haven't heard from anyone at the local authority, but that's fine. Um, so she gave me her name and I sent her um, just a basic email saying, um, I've been asked to contact you to let you know this is a school my son would like to go to. Um, she said, well, OK, that's, um, that, that's noted. Um, we'll discuss that when we have the June um, review. Um, that's the SEND review, which is at the end of uh, the school year. She never turned up. Well, then a couple of weeks ago, she found out that the council wasn't going to allow Riley to go to the school that they'd chosen. And just to point out here, the Lee doesn't want her son to go to the school because she wants to get rid of him or she thinks that he wants him to accept the limitations of his condition. It's the opposite. She wants him to go somewhere where she says he will be enabled, where he'll learn to cope independently in an environment where he can gain the skills with people in a si similar situation where he isn't the only blind boy with a helper guiding him around. And she said the three schools suggested by the local authority are in Surrey anyway, and they're around 25 miles away. What about Riley? What does he think of all this? Well, Riley himself doesn't know as yet that the local authority have refused his request to go to New College Worcester. So I was having the conversation with his mum before he came home from school. But when he came back, I asked him about the difference between the schools nearby and the one he was hoping to go to. I would say they are very good schools for people who can see and can all do their normal stuff. But... um. Just when I went to some of these schools, I saw visually impaired people getting took around by helpers and s some visually impaired people's canes were getting knocked. But I think with New College Worcester, they just make you feel more confident about doing it and less disabled. What has the council said uh, about their reasoning for not allowing Riley to go to a school in Worcester? Well, the centres a statement and say this. We always aim to offer parents a place at their preferred school. For children who have a special educational need and disability, parents express a preference for a school and are also offered the opportunity to list three schools in order of their preference. These schools would be consulted with if they're in the maintained sector or under Section 41 of the Children and Families Act, which obliges the local authority to consult with an approved list of independent schools. School places are allocated on an assessment of a child's needs and statutory guidance. It's 
vital this process, process is in place because specialist school places for children with special needs and disabilities are in great demand across the country and may not be able to meet the child's needs. And then in addition, they say, we pride ourselves on offering families a place at their preferred school and we have an excellent track record which is in line with or above any other London borough. And just to confirm that, I had a look at the tribunals uh, per 10,000 of school population from the tribunal service at the Ministry of Justice. And in fact, King Kingston is uh, six people are going to tribunal per 10,000, where somewhere like Sutton has 14.5, Lewisham has 13, and Lambeth has 12.5. So there are plenty of other boroughs that have more parents taking the local authority to a tribunal. Thanks very much, Anna O'Neill, with that report. Eva Atkins is the solicitor representing Riley and his mum, as well as other London families. Eva, thanks so much for your time. How common a problem is this? It's a huge problem for the uh, majority, in fact, of parents of children with special educational needs. Um, and the reason for that is because the places that offer the most specialist support and provision for children are often the most expensive. Um, and local authorities are desperately trying to protect their budgets that have been cut. And so are finding themselves having something of a conflict of interest with parents when they're expressing uh, their statutory right um, as a preference for a particular school. You see, statutory right, yeah, but I would always want the best. And if I were a parent uh, of one of these children, I'd want that, that child to get whatever I wanted, regardless uh, of the cost. Are, are you dealing with lots and lots of families in this situation? Uh, there are lots of families in this situation, yes, and I think it, it's absolutely right to say that all parents, including parents of children who don't have special needs, would like the best education for their children. Um, but I think the difference with these particular children is that they're the most vulnerable children, and if they don't get their needs properly met, then they may well not be able to access education, not be able to access social interaction with other children so they may be very isolated for example in a mainstream provision and also the types of school that we're talking about in Riley's case are also teaching independence um, and life skills for children with those sorts of disabilities um, and that sort of resource just simply isn't available yeah, no, uh, in some of the other schools. I'm sorry for speaking over you Eva. Here's the thing you know barely a day goes by where one of our stories isn't associated with austerity measures and the like and some people might agree with the council that sending a child outside the borough to another part of the country actually isn't the best way to spend taxpayers money and that's absolutely right and they might say that unfortunately within the borough of kingston as it happens and this is not just kingston but many other uh, localities as well there are no specially resourced provisions uh, for children with visual impairments to go to and so whatever happens they have to be looking outside of the borough um, and so you know it's a very unfortunate position um, that there isn't more locally and i'm sure that many parents uh, including riley's mother would absolutely love to be able to send their child to the school down the road but if the school down the road doesn't have the provision to meet his needs or the staff trained to meet those needs um, then he's not going to be able to access education uh, and, and bear in mind that education is a fundamental human right so not being able to access it is actually denying him his human rights. What's the success rate then when these things are being challenged? Is there, is there, a, is there a marker, a barometer? How successful are people? Okay, well, it depends on the type of challenge and uh, fight that they're having, and there's a, a very complicated process. So children at the, the beginning end of that process of trying to access the funding, so a statement of special needs or now an education, health and care plan, um, will often be turned down initially, and there's about an 80% success rate when parents challenge that um, at a tribunal appeal. Uh, it's more complicated when you get to cases where it's about school placement, because of those who go to appeal probably only about 50% are successful at appeal but what the statistics don't show you is that many many of those cases will be fought parents will have a really stressful time going through that process spend lots of yeah. money on securing experts and stuff and get almost to the door of the tribunal and then the local authority will concede so there are uh, quite a lot of cases that are settled um, outside of the courtroom after a long um, and often arduous battle for the parents. Eva please keep us in the loop we'd love to hear here at what's going on. Eva Aikens there, solicitor representing Riley. So here's a mum who's phoned us. I'd love to know, no, oftentimes I talk to you about what it's like to get your child statemented. Uh, but if your child is statemented, 
what's it like then getting the care schooling facilities that they need in order for them in your mind to your mind as their parent uh, to get the kind of support they need look forward uh, to speaking to you about this if it's something uh, that you can feed into teachers would love to hear from you also you know the whole idea and the whole push now is to get children with special needs taught in mainstream schools how is that working out oh to oh seven double two four two thousand more coming up after we've had details of those roads coming up from fiona mckinnon Thank you. BBC Radio London Travel, here's the latest. It's still slow for the M25 clockwise between 14 at Heathrow and 15 at the M4, but clear for the M3 southbound now between 2 and 3 after previous problem. The A13, however, on my camera is still very, very slow eastbound from Canning Town Flyover to Lodge Avenue following a breakdown, but it was already congested. And it's slow for the A406 southbound between the Barking Flyover and the Beckton Roundabout through Wembley on the North Circular. It's slow each way at the Brentfield Road approaching the Bridge Works, and it's queuing for the Finchley road for the A41 northbound between Swiss Cottage and the Arkwright Road. Meanwhile in Catford it's queuing for the A205 eastbound between Rushy Green and Burnt Ash Hill. Full in the traffic lights still stuck on red on the Fulham Road on the A308 at Gunter Grove. Police are there having to direct the traffic. It's very slow because of this but uh, there were delays because of roadworks in the area with delays also on Chelsea Bridge northbound, Albert and Battersea Bridges and of course the Kings Road. Stationary still for Upper Thames Street each way at London Bridge through the Cycle Superhighway Works. Westbound user from Tower Hill and eastbound from Westminster for Parliament Square. Do update us on 020-722-4000 or tweet us at BBC Travel on the trains. There are delays of up to 20 minutes for Abellio Greater Anglia between Liverpool Street and Norwich, Ipswich and Cambridge. No Heathrow Connect service between Hayes and Harlington and Heathrow and revised services to and from Paddington as they're doing safety inspections again on Heathrow Express trains. And on the Tube, the Victoria Line has a good service again. Fiona McKinnon, BBC Radio London, the next update at 5.30. BBC Radio what you really want is for the government to give the Met more money. I mean, are you pro-Met? Are you anti-Met? Whose side are you on? And why are you raising the alarm in this way? The Vanessa Phelps Breakfast Show. What do you think's going on there, Nick? It's cheaper for the police force to employ these consultants. Yeah, but they're saying well over a thousand pounds per person. Oh, who would pay anybody a thousand pounds a day? No one. Come on. Vanessa Phelps putting Londoners first. Uh, she turned twelve last week. Well, she's only uh, twelve last week. What's happening? The Vanessa Phelps Breakfast Show. Don't let your kids have phones with cameras or any way of getting at the internet. DJs from Seven. BBC Radio London. There you go. That's our Vanessa, who's on the radio station from 7 at till 10. I'll listen to her conversation as well. And I was shouting at the radio. That was all sexting this morning, wasn't it? And it's just huge. Anytime I go to a school, talk to a friend who's a teacher or whatever, they say to me, Eddie, do you know what's going on in our school? So it is a, a, a huge subject, fantastically dealt with, as we've come to expect uh, with Vanessa Feltz uh, from 7 till 10 in our all new breakfast show. Uh, we're talking about, well, at four o'clock we started off talking about smacking physical chastisement and i do promise we'll get to you uh, but here's another one it's slightly more nuanced this one it's about and, and often times uh, you know I, I say to people please let us know if there's something going on please let us know i can't promise we'll be able to get to the bottom of all of them but anna will definitely have a look and that's what's happened here with young riley and it's about you know your child having special needs and about the obligation of the local authority to help support find the facility Facilities that would be best suited to your child and as a parent you know what they are but can the authority be expected oftentimes to pay for it that's what we're talking about now once you've received a statement then what's it like what happens then uh, emma's has given us a call on this subject in east london emma thanks very much for getting involved with this one hello tell us hello, your, hello how are you all right i'm all right thank you tell me about your situation uh, my son's 19. He's been, you know, I've known he was special needs since the age of three. Um, you know, we've how, had how did you How did you know, Emma? Um, well, you know, you actually check your child's milestones. I had an older child. He wasn't meeting them. And, you know, he was finally diagnosed with autistic spectrum disorder. He has learning difficulties and he also has epilepsy which is kind of lots of little things all rolled into one. Mm. So I've known since the age of three. But, you know, my heart goes out to Riley's mum because this is a journey that no parent wants to go on. And when you're not getting the support from your local authorities and, you know, your, your only option is to bust your child out of borough, 
it's not fair. Well, help me to understand this. Okay, so you're you're a mum. You've got your child statemented. You've got special educational needs. Uh, the, the, the local authority set up to help you, isn't it? No, no. The local authority is all they're interested in is giving the kids the statements, you know, and then we go to them, you know, they obviously need different things, that we get it put into their statement, the schools don't deliver it, you know, it's a constant battle, Eddie, it's a constant battle so every day, every month, every year just to get your kids an education. Right, help me, Emma, then. Help, help me to understand, please. Because uh, what I'm guessing is, as a mum, you want the best no matter what it costs. Do you appreciate that cost will be a factor so far as any local authority is concerned? But what, what value do you put on a child's life? You know, we're putting more money into antisocial behaviour, but we're cutting boroughs. You know, boroughs are cutting funding for real people. Real, you know, these cuts affect real people's lives. These kids are always going to get affected because they're the easiest ones for the boroughs to cut. No, I get that. You and you've, you've, heard, you've heard me give them a tough time, but yeah. you've also heard, and you know, it's a number of them that we've discussed it with now, and you've heard their response. Our yeah. money is being cut by central government, and therefore we are having to prioritise. When a child needs fostering, when a child needs to go into a home, if we close a library, we close a, a play park, a youth centre, Mills on Wheels doesn't come around, any yeah. of those things we can, people like you come down on us like a ton of bricks. So the money has to come from somewhere. Emma, I, I sound like I'm the authority, and I don't mean to sound like that. I'm just trying to, to, to find out how far you think the local authority should actually go. I think, you know, there should be more support. I don't think there should be less. I think, you know, when you've got a little old lady who can't get her meals on wheels, you know, and they've got no families. Yeah, of course, they need it as much as these kids do, you know. But why are we always cutting the funding for these kids? You know, and these people, it's always the most vulnerable that are hit. And why? How's the boy? How's he doing? You know, Emma, how's you know, he doing? My boy is an angel. I mean, he's beautiful. But, you know, my option is to bus him two hours out of borough for him just to carry on his education. He's not going to cope with that. And then, when you're looking at it, how much is it costing for these boroughs to bus these kids out of borough? And this is where, it, you know, the whole top and bottom of it is. Keep the kids... Keep our kids in the boroughs that they live in, that they've grown up in. Why are you paying other boroughs to take these kids when we should be looking after them? I wish I had an answer for you, Emma. But I wish you and your son the very best of luck. And I appreciate very much uh, you taking the time to get in touch uh, with us. Uh, if you just join us, good evening to you. We're, we're talking and reacting, really. Uh, a parent got in touch with us talking about her child's special educational needs. Uh, it, it, visually impaired, uh, given a choice of school, has gone and found a fantastic school, and then the local authority says, well, we, we can't pay for that. Well, we're not paying for that. He needs to go to this school. This school uh, that they're suggesting isn't set up to deal with his needs. It's about money, it's about intention, and it's about the effort. What, what happens if you're a parent that's got a statement, and you've just heard Emma there, when you get the statement, what then? 020-722-4000. Alistair uh, is on the line. Alistair, thanks so much for talking to me today. Tell me about your teenage son. Yeah, Eddie, it's an interesting one, this. Um, on the point of statement, uh, my son has had a statement since uh, he was uh, around seven, um, and um, he was sent to a mainstream school. We were very happy uh, to take him into secondary mainstream, but unfortunately, it just didn't work for him. Uh, the class sizes, mainly, Eddie, 30-odd children, you know, in a class, he just couldn't cope. He has ADHD, he has oppositional defiant disorder and some social and communication disorders. Just let me stop you, Alistair. Yeah. Well, was there no provision in, in some of the schools that I've visited they get extra money and perhaps have a classroom assistant? In oh, that? totally, Eddie, yeah. I mean, I, I have no qualms whatsoever with the local authority here. They, they did us proud. Um, they gave my son 25 hours of learner uh, support assistance uh, plus two and a half hours of teacher time as well. So it all looked very good on paper, but unfortunately 
allegedly, I did, it backfired on us because he got ridiculed in school for having this learner support with him in class. Uh, the other children were saying he was stupid, he needed an extra teacher to look after him and all that sort of thing. He got so unhappy in that school on top of the fact that literally, Eddie, every week, certainly every day, I was uh, very concerned that I was going to get an email or a phone call, but certainly every week um, we would be called in to, uh, to go and talk to teachers about one thing or another. Just, just identify yeah. again what his uh, uh, challenges were. Uh, uh, well, his challenges are ADHD, which obviously a lot of people, we know this week uh, since that research was just broadcast, um, don't even believe in ADHD. They think it's just naughty children and naughty parents. Well, let me tell them that, you know, just have one day with an ADHD child and you'll know that it's not anything to do with a child being naughty. They have a mental health problem, um, and it's all to do with how their brain is functioning or not functioning as you and, and, and yours and my brain would be working. So he has ADHD. Um, he has oppositional defiant disorder as well on top of that and as I've said social and communication uh, difficulties all added up um, make quite a difficult life for us challenge. parents challenging challenge. yeah stressful so you know we don't really need uh, to be having to challenge our local authority to get him to the school of his choice yeah actually. but is yours about money then because yours no. doesn't sound ab ab like it's about money to me no actually it wasn't Eddie it's a good point uh, and, and I wanted to pick up what your previous caller was saying. Um, in fact, the, di the cost difference between sending him to a mainstream school here in the Twickenham area um, and where he is now in East Sussex is negligible. So because, you know, the school is paid uh, special needs money. Um, they're paid for that um, extra support that he was getting. Um, so our lawyer uh, worked it out, and, and there was very little, little difference between um, asking him to go to the school in East Sussex um, rather than keeping him in the school in Twickenham. What's the state of play now, Alistair? So now, um, I'll tell you one line that, that my son said, Eddie, uh, when he went down there for the first time. He said, oh, it's great, everyone's equal. And that spelled everything for us, you know, it, it, it meant that he felt safe, uh, that all the children have, it is a specialist school, some children have Asperger's, autism, dyslexia and what have you. So he felt safe there and he is progressing now, he is able to learn and I have to say uh, a thank you now to the local authority here, Achieving for Children, that they have only just, Eddie, I can tell you, uh, agreed to pay his educational costs, uh, which I've said are, are roughly the same anyway, uh, but not the board costs uh, down there which is fair enough we're we're prepared to pay the boarding costs so he's going to stay down there and he's getting the kind of love help and support that he needs he is he's getting that nurturing Eddie I have to say you know these schools the mainstream schools their SENCOs and their SEND departments they're they are just so overworked they're overwhelmed uh, not only with ADHD but all the other special needs uh, so I don't blame uh, any teachers uh, within the mainstream at all. Unfortunately, my son just couldn't cope with 30 in a class, etc. He's now in a school of only 100 children. He gets uh, taught by teachers um, who, who are obviously are uh, experienced in special needs, but there's no more than about eight in his class. So he's a lucky boy. I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, he's, got, he's, got, he's got a mum and dad that were fighting for him. As somebody was championing his uh, case. So I, I hope there's no limit to what that child can achieve, and I appreciate your contribution today, Alistair. Fantastic voice and a great story. Uh, glad that it looks like it's having a happy ending.